It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very pleased that uh, Jean-Jacques invited me on short notice to come here to literally uh, show what we are already doing. And we are coming from a stem cell therapy and bone marrow transplant approach, so a little different side. And if I wanted to condense this worthy uh, title into uh, focuses, um, this could be a preview what angiogenesis or anti-angiogenesis could look like if it really and fully and completely worked. Because that concept is hanging there and, and people say, well, if we, were, if we had more impact, it, it should work so well for cancer. But it's very hard to clinically achieve. And we had an opportunity out at Stanford University. Uh, this is a project that is running for more than 20 years, had more than a quarter billion dollars of funding, and had enormous uh, um, supervision and support uh, out there. And we've taken one leg of this and fully implemented that now for more than uh, 12, 13 years in routine practice. This is a data set which I'm presenting here um, which is actual reality, unscreened patient, not cherry-picked, and they typically come with one month to live. Okay, so that's sort of the, the uh, perspective we're having. Cellular intervascular targeting agent means these are cells. They attack cancer from within the blood vessels. There are structural abnormalities inside of the angiogenesis of cancer, which is not found in normal vasculature. And... Uh, so agent just means they're, they're effective as a, as a drug. In this case, they act like a bone marrow transplant procedure. Um, so why did we go after tumor angiogenesis? And uh, we were focusing on challenges in bone marrow transplant initially and then expanded from the blood cancers into the solid cancers. And multi-drug resistance certainly is a challenge for a clinical oncologist. If the uh, drug which you're giving is being pumped out of the cell, only the normal tissues get damaged, and increasing the dose is not a solution here. So we wanted to have a mechanism which was completely independent of the mechanisms of chemotherapy poisoning cells by cell cycle or other means. And we were looking into um, the uh, biological targeting um, because we have in targeted therapies a biological principle which says the more you target a biological principle, uh, the higher is the pressure to mutate it away. Let's say you target a receptor, it will truncate and the, the attack surface on the cell will disappear in some clones and res resistance is pre-programmed. So we were looking into the vasculature as those cells which form the vascular bed of tumors are not mutagenic or they're not mutagenizing. They are normal cells. They're actually tricked to supply a cancer, but they are genetically stable cells. So we found a stable uh, target, and the stability of the target is interesting to us because structure seemed to be um, a very good differentiator between normal and tumor vasculature, 3D structure. So not a gene, a gene expression. For an example, if you were driving from uh, you have nice uh, highways, motorways here in France, nice surface on them, you can drive fast, charge you a good, a good amount of money to drive on them. Let's say you took from one of these restaurants a wrong exit and you got onto an agricultural supply route and it's unsurfaced and there's potholes in it. It would be very quick that you could realize this is not the motorway, this is a dirt road. And so the immune system can also sense the fenestrated, which means there's holes in it, basal membrane of tumor vasculature from any other vascular bed in the body. And I'll show you how that works. So we have here um, um, the data of Judah Folkman. Uh, was already mentioned by William Lee, so I'll just reference it here very briefly, which reversed the algorithm and said, maybe the blood vessels are wrong at supplying tissues they shouldn't supply rather than being simply on only focused on the mutations which are occurring inside of a cancer. And we've been looking into heavily, heavily chemotherapy pretreated patients and said, well, how rapidly could we immune reconstitute those patients for that the immune system can contribute to the turnaround? Remember, these are patients where we maxed out with chemotherapy. And in bone marrow transplant, we are keenly aware of how potent a uh, functioning immune system can be to reject cancer. 
And so we used a group uh, of, of cells, these are pure T cells, which we are through a high tech and, and quality assured process can now manufacture to 500 billion cells. This is half a trillion cell, a thousand times what academic centers typically manufacture. And these cells can be uh, generated autologously in very much the settings typical for bone marrow transplant settings. So there's infrastructures which can handle that. And we knew for a long time that in bone marrow transplant, there was a graft versus tumor, it's called graft versus leukemia effect, which means there was something in the healthy cells brought in which could by itself contribute to or affect the, the cure of cancer patients. Now in bone marrow transplant, we are not shy to use the word cure because we were actually there and paid a lot of money in order to achieve a cure. So our goal is cure, not doing a little better, not having a little longer survival, not just to sell chemotherapy, prolong life at questionable life quality. So it's, it's a different thinking. So this, please excuse, I come from a different planet. We're thinking of cure, we're a little intense, we speak fast, and um, so it's a little different what we do out there. But so we come in here, and our question was, can we generate this effect, the graft versus leukemia effect, and separate it from a second effect, which is called graft versus host disease, which is a bone marrow transplant not gone well. That's a donor whose cells will proactively attack the patient to the extent he gets very, very sick. And initially we thought that the cells which cure cancer patients from within the graft were the same cells which would cause this terrible disease called graft versus host disease. Um, I cut this short to be really focused. It turns out these are completely separate cell population. We can separate them and we can now farm a sheer graft versus tumor or graft versus leukemia effect by the 100 billion cells. So that gives us a tool which is rather unique. We can now work with cells within the patient, and it turns out the cells which act on solid tumors are anti-angiogenic. That's the mode of attack. And so I thought it would be a nice way of just looking a little into that. We produce them, and we produce them that any oncology nurse can do a 15-minute drip infusion, a stem cell dose, or for a patient. Patients come Monday to Friday, they're getting a drip infusion each day, and then they're getting a before and after CT scan, and they go home. And, um, so now the cells, they recognize abnormal structures, as I mentioned, and it's not only structures. So the cells come into the blood supply, and they're rolling over the surface of the uh, angi an cancer angiogenesis, and they're calling out what is called a non-kill signal, a signal which will keep immune cells from attacking. It's a Nobel Prize to Karl Lundgren for this in the NK system, natural killer cell system. And T cells of this kind they use an older receptor than the NK cells. It's like 550 million years old. Irv Weisman has worked on it. And it's an MHC class one mimic, which is generated by all normal tissue vasculatures, which is a collagen chaperone. Now, Judah Folkman was very close. He had collagen split products stopping angiogenesis. Now, it turns out collagen itself, if a cell would make molecule after molecule, and it would polymerize inside the cell, the cell would die similar to a sickle cell anemia cell when the uh, hemoglobin, the mutant uh, hemoglobin would just form an aggregate. So the monomers, the single unit of production of collagens types two and four, are kept from each other by a chaperon. And the chaperon is called collagen or Hitchcock protein 47 by means of discovery. And that molecule looks like MHC class one HLA type. And that is a very well known um, molecule in the field of uh, non-kill signals and how to control selectivity of T cell attacks. NK cells don't have that, and so they, they, can, they are very unspecific. They do a lot of collateral damage called vascular leak syndrome. These cells we're working with are absolutely tight. They only go after tumor vasculature. They do it rapidly, they do it aggressively, and there's typically no survivors. Because they are going, that's not patients, but uh, tumor vascular for cells, I should add here. So they go into the vasculature and cause a blood clot of any detected vessel with these structural abnormalities. The Japanese have shown that the expression of collagen is 1,000-fold reduced in tumor vasculature. It's not a surprise. Collagen is not produced by endothelial cells. It's only produced by fibroblast and smooth muscle cells, which are not sprouting out. It's just 
uh, reduction of those cells which make collagen, which makes the extracellular matrix of tumor blood vessels uniquely uh, vulnerable to the attack of these cells. So now they come in and uh, uh, they, we have the um, structural differences, we have the molecule behind it, and the important thing for us is multi-drug resistance is, is not a variable which we're interested in. This mechanism is a granzyme release on non-killed signal having cells, period. Whether the cell has been pretreated with 15 chemotherapies or has been just a naive cell, it's no difference for these cells. I'll show you quick animal data. I want to get to the clinical data on humans, but these are skid mouse. This is like, gosh, 20 years, 23 years ago. Um, we grafted at Stanford mice with full thickness skin, gave uh, the skin, a human, so human skin on a skid mouse, uh, then there's a melanoma cell line which we implanted into, into the mouse. And now we're going with human uh, CETA cells after the human tumor and the human tumor vasculature. And we can see there's a concentric attack of these cells going, finding blood vessels, cutting them off, putting a thrombus in. Uh, this is one of about 400 publications in this field. I sh spare you all of them. But we knew there was a selective attack we could mount. It was a mouse model which became a humanized model, all human tissues and we moved into human patients here. We could show very quickly that the cells we have uh, could be raised, for us again, very important, in heavily, heavily pretreated chemotherapy, pretreated patients. Because the concern is if are all immune cells dead. And it turns out there are cells which are resting, which we can collect as a peripheral blood collection. And uh, those resting cells very readily grow out, uh, expand over 6,000 fold, and give rise to what we use clinically. Now there's two, two mechanisms in leukemias. Uh, we see a lot of direct killing. So this is a treatment we use for blast crisis. We have patients which come to us with 60% blast and they're around years later and this is a monotherapy. It's a very unique, extremely powerful therapy in comparison. And we see here some cells swimming up. That's an ICAM-1 uh, overexpressing tumor cell. ICAM-1 in the cell, the cell adhesion molecule one is uh, represented with seven genes in a genome. Uh, as cells mutate, they lose the ability to make a normal glycocalyx. So the cell, even the cancer cell, loses negative charge. A cell with a ne negative charge can't pull in nutrition. So the tumor cell makes up missing molecules by overexpressing the symbols to express mo molecule, which is ICAM1. In comes our killer cells. They are calling for ICAM1. You see a capping here. They see the signal is way too high. It's about 1,000 times higher than in a normal cell. That's their killed signal. So they kill through unopposed co-stimulation of ICOMOM LFA1. Very nice because it catches a lot of other randomly mutated cells. We don't have to find all of the specific mutations. We don't have to target all of these specific mutations. This is a one therapy with fits all approach for leukemias. But I wanted to show you here the solid cancer data because in bone marrow transplant, we are pretty good in, in leukemias. But uh, when it comes to solid cancers, we are li lacking solutions. This is a skid mouse which has a light emitting uh, cell line. This, uh, this is a mouse in a dark chamber, it's an anesthesia. We give two groups of mice the same amount of cells. We treat with our cells. Um, we had also series we can show um, at the efficiency of triple combination chemotherapy, you can eradicate the cells or with our immune cells. So we could show that it can eradicate these are peritoneal implants. And it's, again, from the clinical side, we've treated patients with carcinomatosis, which is a real challenge in clinical oncology, and have patients which are multi-year survivors after having had carcinomatosis of the lung, carcinomatosis of the abdomen, of the peritoneal. So um, these are studies. The largest studies were out at 450 patients, 150 patients with Takayama. Um, so at Stanford, we got scooped, so we didn't get our biggest study in first, but we got the patents, and in Silicon Valley, that's good for us too. So the patents went to Stanford, the publications went to Japan. I think we're all happy. Now, we are now in routine treatment. We got full approval in 2004, and we have our, our, a treatment now which uh, is able to go and help patients with had massive chemotherapy replenish the immune system, and just say, well, that is the best we can do, these are patients, as I said, one month to live, very sick patients, and that's a compassionate use uh, arm, and this product is called Immune Rebuilt. Show you quickly how that goes. Patient gets an aphoresis, product gets shipped, arm goes into CGMP manufacturing, 
but we are very, very careful how we manufacture the cells, optimize nutrition uh, to the cells, and our goal is to grow, as I said, an enormous immune system artificially from, from seed, if you see one from the hematopoietic stem cells, and the body couldn't nourish those cells possibly, so we go outside of the body, and so the body would be free to do ketogenic diet whilst we are growing the sugar-dependent um, lymphocyte cultures. Now, we're looking for special subsets here. Um, these are uh, the CETA subset, is CD356 um, uh, cells predominantly, the CD8 cells, the pure T cells, and we find in patients at high risk that they are having uh, much less than 10% of the normal immune surveillance of these cells. So we go and we use our cells. Now you see there's a massive increase under this last hole, even if you don't count the individual dots. Trust me, this is like 26% of the culture is now activated in the cells. All other cells come from the patient, they go back into the patient. We are not purifying the other cells away, which allows us to have highly functional, highly granular cells, which have a high activity. Now, um, after the infusion, we can now show we've reconstituted this patient to 10%. And let's look what this does for an actual patient. Here's a patient who comes to us at age 84, that has a 10 pound midline uh, stage four prostate cancer, had a uh, 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 fifth uh, massive myocardial infarction on a uh, surgery to reduce a tumor mass, and this luck got off the operating table alive. Comes to us, we make his autologous cells, now we're starting to infuse them wherever there's a triangle we're infusing, and we're measuring LDH. Lymphocytes don't have LDH, but it's measured in this test. Um, the tissue as it, the tumor tissue has lots of it, and we can see that within four, eight, 12 hours, we get a massive peak. So we're literally sitting there and watching the tumor being lysed within four hours. Multidrug resistant cancer, we're sitting there watching. Each day they get a new dose. After about day three, the patients report to feel dramatically better. This one, what we see here is what we call a, a reperfusion peak. That's when the lymph washes out the lysed tumor. Patients are put on a tumor lysis protocol, bone marrow transplant style, we never had any complication from acute kidney and necrosis which could happen if the body gets overloaded with phosphate and calcium. Now, we're looking here, this is the summary clinical data that I wanna show you. Please keep in mind, we have patients which are referred to us from the best medical center, be it King Faisal or be it Harvard or be it MD Anderson, Stanford, other centers with one month life expectancy. In control, they actually died. So in other words, we have patients where we prepared the cells and before we got the needle into their arm, they died. So really sick, multi-drug resistant patients. I will show you two cohorts. Um, and uh, this one here is a scale in month. So we show you one cohort where patients survive about uh, 10, 15 times as much. That's our compassionate arm. And there's a comment about what they died of. Because in most cases, it was not cancer, but it was uh, recovering from um, a massive uh, aspects from malnutrition and um, we get there. And then it's the second group, which we take in an intent to cure rescue, called a cancer rescue. We have patients which are 10, 12 years out. We have, uh, none of our patients died in the first three or four years. And I think if, if I was a patient which had one month to live, I would love to have one of those outcomes. And uh, the, the, this treatment has no side effects. So the patients have to hydrate heavily to, to get rid of the cancer um, um, as it falls apart. Um, but so the, the characteristics of the treatment we should talk about is, is very, very favorable. But so repeat treatment, if necessary, wouldn't have the same problems as a repeat uh, myoablative dose would have in a cancer patient undergoing bone marrow transplant. So very quick, these are the patients which are under control. Um, they all die before one month. There was a life expectancy. So these are the ones which died. So you, the curve should extend over into the treatment arm. Um, now we have, if we treat the patients here with one month uh, um, expectancy compassionately, we see we're getting a, a good improvement of survival uh, in these patients up to 10 times on a single uh, set of, of repeat treatments with no other side effects, which for those patients, the only other option would be ultra high dose chemo, which is very, very side effect burdened and has only a 2% one year survival likelihood. Um, here we're looking at the uh, treatment arm for the uh, intent to cure uh, patients. And we see our patients survive out four years, five years, six, seven years. And these are alive at 10 years and 13 years. And uh, the, the patients actually died of uh, very unrelated things. So uh, we had one patient 
which uh, after three years underwent an elective uh, chemotherapy. We were out of touch with her at this time. We don't know whether it was uh, just because it's a maintenance therapy or not, but she died of a complication of chemo. Uh, this patient uh, died from a myocardial infarction. He had come to us with a blast count of 60, for those which are not hematologists, extremely high count with hyperviscosity and of a very aggressive lymphoma type. And four years later, he died of a heart attack. Um, and then the next patient also died of a, a heart attack um, at uh, seven, uh, sorry, this patient here died of tuberculosis. He had been stopped his medications when he had one month to live at MD Anderson and was uh, uh, sent <coughs> out and eventually tuberculosis caught up with him five years later. But he lived a full life, it's a medication error. Um, we have a patient who just died at about seven years old. This is a gentleman who came at seven years, uh, came um, at age 84 with his 10 pound prostate cancer pit and uh, he went on die, uh, uh, golfing, died of a myocardial infarction on the golf course seven years later. So this is, these are a lot of causes of death which have nothing to do with the primary cancer and show that if you have a massive and overwhelming force, sorry, I should have warned you, this is a little graphic. Um, so the question, I'll just go one further that you can rest your eyes. The question is, is this something which is really powerful? And you saw there another 10 pound cancer which surgeons declined to reduce, patient risk is miserable, condition, one month life expectancy. And what you saw on the right hand side when it's cherry size is after this monotherapy. So surgeons could go in, do a reconstructive internal uh, surgery and the lady is now out I think 10 years and has resumed a full, fully normal life. That always monotherapy of these massive doses of half a trillion cells. And up here it has put in the actual outcomes of the patients in these arms and you see uh, a lot of this is actually care issues, pulmonary embolism out here uh, we had an op accidental opiate overdose when somebody was switched to a fentanyl patch and got the full doses of his opiates. In addition, um, these were, we are an outpatient center which I'm reporting from, and so when patients go back in the home environment, this is often a little um, up to the, the center there and to get attention. But overall, um, I just wanted to focus on two things, and that goes back to Jean-Jacques here. Um, I wanted to honor the incredible, the courage of the patients which goes in trying something new. And I want to honor my dad who's on the other side, his 80, 81st birthday is coming up. We sure had a great father and son time after I came back from Stanford to work with him. And uh, so our outreach, you see a couple of sites down there. We are Venture Philanthropy Group, uh, and I didn't want to connect to myself. But um, we are really concerned about what can we do for all of you patients or for physicians which want to just bring resources to patients to help turn this around. I will is expect that many of the bone marrow transplant centers around the globe will have this soon in their catalog of options and will be able to help with that. I want to help thank everyone here, William Lee, Lex Agamon, Ber uh, Bernard, Jean-Jacques, and of course the teams at Stanford, my own teams. Thank you very much.